So we're going to be in John chapter 7. This is interesting to me. We're going to read these verses. I'm going to ask you to join me standing out of respect and reverence for the reading of God's word. The scripture reads in John chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. After this, Jesus traveled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord. Father, we praise you and we thank you, Lord, for your inspired word. Father, it is true. It is timeless, Lord. It doesn't change for you're an immutable God. It's the same today, tomorrow, and forevermore. So, Father, we pray you bless the reading of your word this morning. Give us insight and, most importantly, application. For we give you praise and glory, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, pray for me. I've come off a midnight shift, and I am wiped out. I am exhausted. So I'm tired, but uh, I pray that God will give me the grace to get through this. So in, Mar in John chapter 7, the scripture reads, After this, Jesus traveled around Galilee. After what? After he taught the parable of the unforgiving debtor. Once he taught about the, the, the parable of the unforgiving debtor, after he was done with that, he traveled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. Jesus is God. Amen? Yes. Do you think he was, he was a coward? Do you think he was, this was an act of cowardice? No. That he stayed out of Judea because he didn't want to go there because he didn't want to deal with the, the, the fact that they're going to try to kill him? It's not that he was a coward. It's down to God's time, no doubt. But the fact of the matter is avoiding problems is prudent sometimes. Now, there may come a time in your life, there may come a time in your walk with God where he calls you to stand up and to, be, and to face that danger. But if it's, we should be guided and directed by the spirit of God in our life. And the spirit of God will tell you, hey, you need to go right into the face of that danger. You need to stand up and you need to be a witness. Or the Spirit of God will tell you, you know what, now is not the time for that. Yeah. Amen? If you examine history, I mean current history in the, in the recent past, there's been martyrs for Christ. Amen? Amen. The Columbine one is the most, one of the most famous ones where the girl was, was instructed by the gunman to uh, renounce her faith in Christ or he was going to kill her. And she said, I would not. And bang, he shot her. Remember that one? That's just one example. There's, there's, there's tons of others. So uh, apparently this girl was moved by the Spirit of God to stand up for her faith. But Jesus said, if you deny me in front of my father or deny me in front of men, I will deny you in front of my father. So there comes a time where we have to stand up, put up or shut up. Amen. And the spirit of God will give you guidance in that. So Jesus did not go uh, like the Bible says he traveled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea because the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. Now, there's a twofold thing here. This is incredible. Listen to the spiritual implication. First of all. Jesus is teaching his disciples. I'm pretty sure he wasn't worried about death. There's a time in the, in the scriptures where they actually came to stone him. The Bible says he slipped away. Jesus was not going to go until his time. And he knew that. But the problem was if he came to teach Enrique's family in Hammond. And the authorities in Hammond said, hey, we're not going to put up with this Jesus stuff. And they listen and they, they're listening to this preacher anyway. When Jesus leaves, they're going to pay the price for that. You, you, you follow me? There's a synagogue. They're, they're not going to be able to go into the temple. They're going to be excommunicated. So they're gonna, he's going to cause them problems. Now's not the time, Jesus said. So I'm not going to go over there right now because it causes them problems. But listen to this. The very gospel that's being proclaimed is the light of the world. Amen. Jesus is teaching and preaching about salvation. And the very, listen, this is a spiritual implication, church. The very people who are rejecting him and don't want to hear it, he withdrew from them. He withdrew from them. He deliberately stayed away. So the gospel message was not going there. Are you following me? Yeah. The spiritual implication, church, is this. There's a time where the gospel is preached and proclaimed. And again, I shared this, uh, that we, I shared this last week when we were at Brother Frank's home group. There's a time where the gospel is preached and proclaimed. And people stiff arm God. They say, no thanks, I don't want to hear it. And then it's withdrawn from them. And that opportunity is never presented again. Now, lucky for them, it came back later. But right at this time, darkness is there because the light has been removed. 
Do you see that? This is important. Don't miss that. So they're trying to kill Jesus. And you say, well, how does that apply to us, Pastor? It applies. It applies when we don't share the gospel when we should, when God gives us the divine opportunity and we choose not to, and we blow that opportunity. Procrastination was what Frank's home group was about talking about. We can lose that opportunity where the gospel light is going to be withdrawn. He wanted to stay out of Judea because the Jewish leaders, they were plotting his death. And you know what? They were receiving, they were reaping what they have sown. Now you say, well, I don't know how that applies to me. Your heart. When your heart's not prepared to receive what God is giving you, you may not get another opportunity. So verse 2, but soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters. And Jesus' brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. Now, sounds like, an intro, sounds like, a, like, a, like a legitimate concern. First, let me back up to this, this feast of, the, uh, of shelters. Go to verse 2. Does somebody have a different translation? Because my NLT says shelters. Somebody got something different? The tabernacles. So read, read verse 2 for me, JR, if you don't mind. Okay. The Jewish Feast of Tabernacles. Now, we're not Jewish. Most of us are not. And so the Jewish tabernacle thing might go right over your head. This is in, I'm telling you, the, the word of God is always deeper than it appears. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles was uh, a memorial. And the children of Israel wandered for 40 years, 40 years in the woods, in the wilderness. They lived in shelters. They had, a, they had tents. They lived up. Uh, the, the, the tabernacles where they actually uh, worshipped. So this feast, it's a seven-day feast where the Jews come together to remember the wilderness mercies. Church, you think, okay, that's the Jewish stuff. They were remembering the wilderness mercies. Do you have a time in your life? We sing that song, blessed be your name, when it all, the world's all as it should be, and the sun's shining down on me, blessed be your name. And blessed be your name, when the, was that when the road, on the road marked with suffering, and there's pain in the offering, Lord, blessed be your name. See, there's times in our lives where we'll walk in that road of suffering and sacrifice. There's walking the road of pain and discouragement and despair, and God was faithful to you. Trust me on that. I was listening to this preacher on YouTube. Oh, my gosh, thank you for the link, brother. Come here, I'm going to use you as an example. Frank, come up here, too. I'm going to use you both. This is incredible. It's talking about finding your confidence in God. And he says, where do you find your confidence in God? Thank you. He said, where do you find your confidence in God? And he goes like this. Turn around. Come over here, Frank. Hey, dude, you been working out? A little bit. He's kind of slow, man. All right, so here's the deal. He says, where do you find your confidence in God? He says, what happens, this is, this is incredible. The long old sermon boils down to this illustration. It was incredible. He says, you know, everybody tells you, don't look back. Don't look back, man. You know, God's delivered you from that. This, this preacher's saying, look back. Because he says, what we find our discouragement is when you're standing in this gap and you're like, man, this is where I want to be. This is where I want to be. And you're like this. <laughs> you've never seen it. How many of you have been there? You're trying to get here and you've never seen to get there. Can I get an Amen. I know I've had conversations with brothers about that. Hey, man, I, what's next? What's the next level? I don't even know how to get there. And you're like this. You're trying to reach there, and you don't know how, and it's frustrating. And you think, man, I ain't never going to get there, man. I just, I'm spiritually dead, man. I'm just, and you're like this, and you're moping. And so you lose your confidence in what this preacher called the gap. He says, look back. I think it was Martin Luther King. He says, you know what? I'm not the man that I desire to be yet. But thank God I'm not the man that I used to be. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And so this preacher is basic. This is what he says. The gap between where you are now and where you used to be should be bigger than this one. And this is where you find your confidence in God. You say, well, how's that so? Go ahead and have a seat. You say, how's that so? He says, David, when he went, King David, when he was a little shepherd boy, went before the king and said, hey, I'll fight, the, I'll fight that giant. Goliath, he said, I'm not scared of him. God has delivered me from lions and bears. No tigers, but from lions and bears. 
and he'll deliver me from that Philistine too. So you look back at the faithfulness of God and you know God has been faithful to you on the road marked with suffering and when there's pain in the offering, blessed be his name. Amen. Amen. We need to remember that God is faithful all the time. It is us who wander from him. He never wanders from us. Never. And it is us who want what we want and don't want what we don't want. And so that's the problem. So the thing, the point of this is this, that the Jewish festival of shelters was to remind the Jews of their wilderness mercies. There's a second part to that. It was also futuristic to let them know about this new Israel that's coming to Israel in the world, the Jesus Christ. And it's in verse 38 and 39 of the same chapter. Somebody want to turn there? Let's read it. Why not? Same chapter. John chapter 7, verse 38 and 39, I believe. Yeah, read it. <clears throat> Anyone? What he said is actually verse 37. Go back to 30, uh, 38. Go back to 38. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scripture declares rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Man, I'm telling you, you read this stuff and you probably just kind of gloss over it and don't get it. But let's connect the dots here. Verse 39. He said when he said living water, he was speaking of the Holy Spirit that's yet to come that has not come because Jesus had to leave. So he's getting ahead of himself. Jesus is foretelling. He's prophesying. The Spirit, he's speaking of the Spirit that will be given to everyone who believes in him. And the, body, the Bible says it's one baptism, one Spirit, one Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen? All right, so this is what he's talking about. He says this Spirit has not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. So this shelters, this festival of shelters, this festival of tabernacles is talking about the time where we are coming into this shelter of God. As the, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. You know the song? The righteous run into it and they are saved. That's the song. That's what we're singing about. This coming, this time that is coming. So this festival was not only a memorial to remind them of the, God's faithfulness, but to promise of the promise. If God's been faithful in the past, then what do we know? He'll be faithful in the future. Amen? Amen? Amen. Because we know that God is immutable, which means he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Okay, so this is the purpose of this tent festival. They had to go and live in these tents for seven days to commemorate what God has done for them. What do you do to remember what God has done for you? Is there something that you do? We do as a church, we do the Lord's Supper to remember his death, his burial, and his resurrection. This is we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus said that. But what do you do? Is there a time in your life where you cried out to God and said, Lord, there's a song we sing, uh, I cried out for your hand of mercy to heal me. You know that song? I need your love to free me, O oh Lord, my rock, my strength and weakness. Come rescue me, O oh Lord. You are my hope and your promise never fail me and my desire is to follow you forever for you are good for you are good for you are good to me amen? amen this is what we sing you know he's been faithful to you You know he's been good to you what is the song of your heart what is it that you do to remember his faithfulness to you or is it just god has been good but what has he done for me lately Let's move on here. So this is what he's talking about, this festival that's happening. <laughs> Let me back up for a second. I was down in Sunday school, and Brother Nick was talking about the church's mission and uh, this global mission, the local mission, was talking about people uh, doing things that they're not really gifted in. They kind of, you know, and uh, I walked in late, and uh, Brother Dave, or Nick said, it's like the singer wants to be the preacher, and the preacher wants to be the singer. And I peeked around the wall, and Brother Dave said, it's not a hit on pastor, and I started laughing. <laughs> So I was like, man, I hope I don't have to sing today. And look at that, man. These songs are popping into my head. So forgive me. I'm not trying to be the singer. But these songs are, should be the songs of our heart reminding us of God's goodness to us. Amen? 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 
Well, so if God's been good to you, let me hear you say amen. amen. So Jesus' brothers tell him, the Bible says, the festival of the shelters is coming and the festival of the tabernacles is coming. And it was every Jew's responsibility to go. You had to go. The males. You had to go. And look what they tell him. Leave here and go to Judea uh, where your followers can see your miracles. Sounds sincere, doesn't it? But in my passage, it is titled, the, the passage that we're in says this. Jesus' brothers ridicule him. How does yours read? Anyone? Uh, beginning in John chapter 1, verse 7, or John chapter 7, verse 1, how does that passage read? Did you got a title? The discourse. They, the, discourse. the discourse. What's your, any bias? Jesus and his brothers. Mine Jesus and his brothers. Mine says Jesus and his brothers ridicule him. Didn't believe him. Didn't believe him? Disbelief. All right, well, check this out, because if you read this verse, it says Jesus' brother said, hey, man, the shelter festival's going on. We need to go. That's what it sounds like. But if you read between the lines, they're taking a poke at him. Let's check it out. Leave here and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. That's why I hate text messages. You read text messages, you read into them. Well, what's his voice inflection? What's his tone? What's he, is that a sarcastic no? Was that a no? Or was that a No. no. You can't read that in a text message. So this is what you're missing here. So check this out. This is right here. This right here is a, hey, Jesus, why don't you leave here and go to Judea so your followers can see your miracles? That's more like what they're saying. Okay? Of course, they're masking it. It's not so obvious. So check it out. Go to the next verse, 4. He says you can't be, this is his brothers talking to him. His brothers, his biological brothers. Now, some believe it's probably stepbrothers from, you know, Joseph, not necessarily Mary. It don't matter. They're his brothers. If you grew up in a blended house, you know what I'm talking about. My half-brothers are my brothers. We're raising the house together. I mean, we don't play that half-step stuff. We don't do that. We just, if, you, if you're from a family like that, you know what I'm talking about. Amen? Amen? So Jesus says, okay, they say, you can't become famous if you hide like this. <laughs> Calling them out, challenging them on his pride. You know what dudes do? Dudes, I mean, we're prideful. You ladies are too, but we guys are bad. <laughs> you ladies are a little more subtle. We're a little more, oh, heck no, he called me out. You know, oh, you know, that's what we do. <laughs> Not me, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I shared this before, like when we used to break dance back in the day, man, you, they called burning them. You get up and you burn the dude, you, mm, you look at him like, yeah, and you walk back to your, to your side, and this dude's like, oh, and the guys are like, oh, man. And you have to respond. You can't just sit there. You just got punked out in front of all your friends. So this is what they're doing to Jesus. This is what they're doing to him. They're calling them out. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. I don't know that they really wanted him to go there and get killed. I think they were just trying to chump him out. I think if Jesus would have said, all right, let's go, they might have been like, hey, man, they're going to kill you. What, are you crazy? I don't know that they really wanted to do him harm. But then again, who knows? Look at Joseph in the Old Testament. His brothers sold him out. Amen? So who knows? But they're challenging Jesus. But I want to focus on the word famous for just a second. Somebody's translation read different? Public figure. Public figure. <laughs> Brother Nick talked about this in Sunday school, about the, G the Jews thought that Jesus was coming to establish a, a political reign. They thought he's coming to break the, 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 the oppression the tyranny of the, uh, Russia, of the uh, Ro Roman government and even the, the religious leaders of the day. So his, his, his brothers are telling him, hey, man, you know, and they're thinking the same thing. Apparently, if you want to go and be famous, if you, wanna, uh, if you want all this publicity, you know, you're not ever going to do that here. I examine this passage, church. Once again, I don't preach for information. I preach for application. How does this apply to us? Well, let's go back. Go to verse 3 again. Said to him, leave and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. What are they after? What is the goal? You know, we as a church, we should have a goal. We should have a vision. We should have a direction that we're moving. Is it to build a mega church? I don't know that that's what God's called us to be. Where is you? Let's take away from the church. Let's go into individual lives. What is your goal? Does your family have a mission statement? What is your goal? You know what God desires from you? Godly offspring. That's what he wants. 
He wants my grandson to be raised in the fear and admonition of the Lord. He wants my great, great grandchildren. We have to pass the baton. That's what God desires. The Bible teaches this. But what do we want? I just want to be the super pastor. Big ass on the chest. Hey, hey, I'm the man. Is that what I want? I want to build this mega church that, you know, so I can be glorified. Jesus' brother said, here, leave here and go to there where your followers can see your miracles. They want to see these things. Go, go show yourself to the world. And Jesus' response is profound. But my question is, those are his brothers. But we know the Bible says we don't wrestle flesh and blood. Amen? So there's spiritual factors that are moving everything. So these brothers chirping in his ear, attacking his pride, are the very things that attack our pride. It's chirping in our ear. One of, one of the questions that I hear over and over again is, Pastor, you know, why isn't the church growing? And I say, who's the last person you invited to church? Who, where's the last door we knocked on? We. Now, I'll shoulder some of that responsibility in church, but you got to take it too. What's the last door we knocked on? Brother Solomon squat on Tuesdays all by himself because nobody wanted to go with him. Clack, clack, clack. He hasn't done it in a while. He's abandoned that. Why? I don't know. Maybe discouragement. I don't know. He's 80-something years old. Maybe that's why. Leave here and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles so they can see this what you're doing. In our individual lives, what does that look like? I pulled somebody over the other day, was speeding. I walk up to the car. He's got his hands on the, <laughs> on the steering wheel. He rolls the window down. And I walk up. I look at him. And I go, Reverend Weems? And he goes, he goes, no, nah, I probably shouldn't say that on live stream. He goes, my bad, my bad, my bad, Pastor. And he goes, yay, how you doing? He was the police chaplain. He's our chaplain. And I caught him speeding, you know. I was talking to him, you know. And I don't even know why I brought that up. <laughs> you know, oh, because you know, or, or is you know, is is that what he wants, Reverend Weems? Does he want? Did he become the police chaplain so he could have uh, neighborhood credibility? So he could? You know, I don't think so. He's a man of God who desires to preach the word of God. Why do we do what we do in our individual lives? You want status? I, I'm a pastor. I'm a deacon. I, I'm deacon. De I knew a guy who I worked at the water department. He introduced me to another guy. Say, hey, this is deacon so and so, and I'm like, deacon? That's first name. I'm serious. I didn't know nothing about the church at that time. He goes, no, he's a deacon in the church. I said, what's a deacon? I didn't even know what that was. But that's everybody called him deacon. That was his name. I'm like, wow. I didn't think nothing at the time. But today I look back and I'm like, wow. I don't want people on the street introducing me. Hey, this is Pastor Jose. I mean, I guess that's fine, but I don't want that. I, I can't stand when my family introduced me to their friends. Hey, this is my brother. I was telling you about This is my brother, the cop. I'm like, don't tell people that. You know, I'm so much more than a cop. Don't, I don't want to be recognized as a policeman. I mean, I'm, it's what I do. It's not who I am. Why do we do what we do? Why are you a Christian? You have this big cross in front of your house. You got the Jesus bumper sticker on you. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, being a witness. But why is the question, the motive? So they say, hey, let's go over there so your, your followers can see your miracles. Why? Why? So that Jesus can make a name for himself, so that he can establish this. You know, that's what they're, they're pushing. But see, Jesus' mission was significantly greater than that. Amen? Amen? Let's go to the next verse, verse 4. You can't become famous if you hide like this, if you do such wonderful things. Show yourself, man. You got so much to offer. Jesus, step out, step out. Verse 5. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. There's your key verse that tells you that they're sassing him. They're not being sincere. Notice they didn't say, hey, let's go to Jerusalem. They said, you should go. Go, go to verse 6. Go and tell me, how it went. tell me how it works out for you. Jesus replied, now is not the right time for me to go, but you can go. You go. Uh, I get some chuckles now. Whoa, wait. Hey, pastor, we should go knocking on doors. Hey, go ahead. We should do these things. Jesus is responding. Again, I'm always looking into, when I read the text, I read the text, how it applied to them, how does it apply to us, and then how does it apply to me. Time. The Bible says there's a time and season for everything. Amen? Amen? We know this is true. So Jesus tells them, hey, now's not the right time to go for me, but you can go anytime. By all means, go ahead. <laughs> verse, verse 7. We'll get, uh, the world can't hate you, but it does hate me because I accuse it of doing evil. Now, 
This is important. G those, those disciples could subtly go into that hostile environment and share the, the Lord, share the word of Jesus Christ in a manner that's a little less intrusive, it's a little more covert, it's a little more easy than Jesus could. Are you following me? Yeah. Here's the application. I'm trying to give it to you. Jesus is saying, hey, you can go. You know, JR, you can go. And JR is like, all right. You know, because JR slides in. He, he's, he's not a pastor. He's the chief of staff of a city. He's the mayor's right-hand man. So he can slide into circles I can't slide into. And he's not offensive because he's not a pastor. He's not beating him over the head with this big King James Version Bible saying, you're going to go to hell if you don't come to the Lord. He ain't doing that. He doesn't, there's no negative stigma that comes with being a chief of staff. Well, maybe for the, the department heads, but, but I'm talking about spiritually, there's not. So JR can slide in easier than I probably could in certain circumstances. Amen? So Jesus says, the world hates me. They hate me because I'm proclaiming truth. And they, they don't necessarily hate you, so you can slide in and be a little more subtle. So you can go, go ahead. What are you doing? Is what he's saying. Why don't you go? What, you know, I don't know. The, the disciples, you're wasting your miracles here, Jesus. Go, go do them somewhere else. But they're making fun of him. They're actually teasing him. They're sassing him. And this is what's happening here. So we could take a lot from this passage. <clears throat> Jesus replied, now is not the right time. The world can hate. They, hate. they can't hate you, but they hate me because I've accused it of doing evil. You go. I'm not going to this festival because my time has not yet come. After saying these things, Jesus remained in Galilee. Somebody got Romans chapter 10, verse 14? Turn there if you would. I'm sure old fast hands back there is going to get it going. Romans 10, 14. Jesus said, hey, I'm not going, not the right time, but you can go. What do we know about the Bible? The Bible says in Romans, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. saved. Verse 14, that's in verse 9. So in verse 14, it says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? They've never heard about Jesus. And how can they hear unless somebody tells them? The Bible says faith comes by hearing. So part of new creation's initial vision was to cast a net, if you will you know, metaphorically, and drag in the fish, the big ones, the small ones, the dirty ones, the clean ones, the pretty ones, the ugly ones, the ones like the Calumet River and Hammond have, one-eyed fish, three-eyed fish, drag them in. And we'll let God clean them out. Okay, that was the goal of new creation. Cast the net, drag it in. That's the goal. So are we casting the net? What happens is we want a specific kind of fish. So how are they supposed to hear if we don't bring them in, if we don't drag them in? The goal of new creation was not so much evangelistic outreach. Brandon brought this to my attention. He said, Pastor, he said, you drew a schematic. You remember that? I said, I do remember that. How many of you remember that drawing? You remember it? Those of you who have been with us from the start. In that drawing, I said the, open, the doors that we would use, the primary way that we would bring people to the Lord and to disciple them and to grow them and to follow our core values was how? Who remembers? There was, a, there was a, the front door of this ministry. If you could draw it, what would it look like? It's corporate worship. Then you break out into small groups, men groups, women groups, home groups, and so on and so forth, Sunday school. That's the vehicle for growth. The invitation is to bring them into a friendly worship service. But how in the world are people going to hear about Jesus if we don't invite them? So I go back to the question, Pastor, why, how come the church ain't growing? First of all, it's not... We uh, had John do a uh, uh, trending. We've been here five years now, and I trended to check the trends, the attendance trends. John, what'd you find? Where you at? What'd you find? <coughs> for the last five years? This time, last year, for the last five years. So the trending shows that we've actually increased. If you look at the trend, because I had him draw, uh, do the computer analysis, and he gave me a, a, a printout, and the trending shows that we haven't really declined. We've grown a little. But we can grow, we can grow a lot. Of. We can double in size tomorrow if everybody invited one person. Think about that. And it was intentional on investing in that person, inviting them back. 
how can they call on the person they've never believed in and how can they believe in the one they've never heard of? I'm sure there's a person who's lost in your circle that you can invite. We're having a friend day in October. Go to the next, oh, I'm sorry, that's, a, that's Romans 14. So my point is that Jesus tells them, hey, look, I'm not going, but you can go. So my question is, who are you inviting? Who in your circle are you inviting? If you look at uh, John, actually the next event, it's in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. I'm going to just push through this one. It's one verse, and then I'm going to move to the next one. If you're in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, the scripture says, as the time drew near for him, Jesus, as this time drew near to him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. That's nine, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Somebody have a different translation? Luke 9, 51. If you have it, read it. I'm reading NLT. But the day of grace for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So JR has resolutely as well. Anybody got a different word? Steadfast. Steadfast. Anyone else? Determined. Determined. Anyone else? Got one? Spilled. Stealed. Spilled. He's moving on. Stilled. That's a good one. Anyone else? What do we know? When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. Determined. Um, I have a, uh, I tell you this. I'm a, <laughs> I have to share this story. There's a policeman on our police department. Um, we're, we're, all, we're all people in a uniform. Everybody's different. Uh, he went to a, a call, and he, uh, he, it, was a, it was a domestic call where a husband and wife were fighting. Officer responds, there's hooting and hollering going on inside the house. You probably should have waited for another officer to go in with him. But when somebody's screaming for help, do you want to wait? You know, that's a choice you have to make as an officer. You wait, make sure you're safe to go in, and then you find out you could have stopped something if you would have went in by yourself or you can go in and get yourself hurt. I mean, it's a double-edged sword. Most policemen will go in, and he did. He probably shouldn't have. Uh, I would have went in. I don't know that he should have. Um, and this is why. The guy grabs him. Hey, get out of my house. He grabs the policeman. They start wrestling around on the ground. The guy's bigger than he is, stronger than he is, lands on top of the policeman, and he's choking him. Somewhere in the, the tussle, the officer hit the emergency button on his radio. If you hit that emergency button, it causes an open mic. The mic opens up, and it lets everybody know something's going on, and his identifier on his radio turns up, so you know this is the officer who's tussling, and you can hear what's happening because the mic's open. Mm -hmm. So units are screaming to get there, trying to get there. And um, The first officer who shows up was one of the supervisors uh, who came into the house and removed the guy <laughs> from the officer. Okay? He removed the guy. Um, he's choking him. And uh, the officer said, Whew. he gets up, he's all shooken up, he's, he's afraid, he's shooken up, he looks at the sergeant, he says, man, thank God you showed up when you did, man. I had nothing left, I was about to just give up. The sergeant looked at him and says, give up? Give up? What are you, nuts? Now for some of you this might be hard to take in, he says, shoot him. I ain't giving up. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna catch every bullet I have in my gun before I give up. I'm going to keep fighting to the end. Now, if you got something, give it. There was a, a, a lady, the kid that got gobbled up by the, by the gator in Florida. Remember that story recently? And those parents were like, oh, man, he was trying. The guy's pulling back, and the gator pulled the kid. And I said, man, you got my kid? <laughs> Gator's going to lose an eyeball. I'm coming in the water, and I might get chewed up, but I'm going out trying. I'm not going to watch you take my kid into the swamp. I'm going to somehow, some way, the gator's got eyeballs, and that's probably the weak spot. I'm going to gouge my thumbs and I'm going to bite that eyeball, whatever it takes. He's going to let go of my kid. Even if he's got a bite, I don't give up that easy. It says, time drew near for him to ascend to heaven. Jesus resolutely, steadfastly plowed on. He said, I got a job to do and time is at hand. Amen? Church, how many of you believe we're in the last days? I do. I'm not the doomsday guy. I got the person on Facebook that says, end time prophecy is coming in. They got all these, all, all these and I, I look at them sometimes, and sometimes they got a point, and sometimes they're just fishing, but whatever. I mean, I, just, hey, I read it. I, you know, I got idle time. I'll check it out. If I don't, I won't. 
But if, if you truly believe we're in the last day, and I do, I believe we are, our time is short. Brother Dave kept all, all the time, he says, man, I'm too old. I ain't got time. He's I keep plowing. If you believe we're in the last days, then you believe we're running out of time. We don't have time to be messing around, majoring in the minors. We need to be resolute in our mission as well. Brother Nick was talking in Sunday school about the mission of the church, locally and globally. And look at verse, I'm, I'm going to have you turn with me to, uh, we're in Luke 9, 51, the, the subsequent verse, 52. And he sent messengers, now this is Jesus, he's plowing through, resolutely plowing through his messengers. He sent messengers ahead of him to, Samaritan, to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. But the people of the village didn't welcome Jesus. Why? Prejudice. Samaritans were half-breed Jews. Jews didn't like Samaritans. Samaritans didn't like Jews. But I, thank God that don't apply today, right? No prejudice today, right? We all just get along, don't we? Yeah. Man. The, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Prejudice still exists. Whether you want to believe it or not, it does. Colin Kaepernick, you guys know who he is? Someone on the news about this kid, he's a football player, phenomenal ball player, football player. Uh, won't stand for the national anthem because he says uh, men of color have been uh, oppressed in this great nation of ours. Okay, that's a fact. Can't argue that. Yeah, <laughs> but he, he ain't one of them. He's the multi-million dollar man. And he's a man of color. He's got, he's got money. I mean, he's, got, he's living the American dream on the freedoms of people who died to defend that flag and who sing that, who stand for that anthem. And he, you know, he's like, hey, you know. So he's got his own view. And listen, as a man of color, raised in this great nation, I know what he's talking about. Trust me. You don't think I've experienced that? Of course I have. Prejudice. It exists today. It does. There's no place for it in the, in the kingdom of God. Zero. And look what happens here. Jesus says, hey, go ahead of me and prepare the way. Go to Samaria. 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 Go to the next verse. I uh, said so the people there didn't receive him. They didn't want nothing to do with Jesus. <laughs> so James and John saw this. What, what, their pride. All right, so here it goes. James and John, hey, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. They're like, get out of here. They're like, oh, it's like that, huh? They come back and told Jesus, hey, they don't want you here. Should we burn them up? <laughs> and I'm serious. He, see, he ain't messing. He's serious. Should we call down fire from heaven and burn them up? Just say the word, Jesus. It's done. They're going to diss you like that, Jesus. They're going to chump you out. They don't, they don't want no part of you. You're reaching out to them. They're just going to slap the hand like that. Jesus, I say we burn them up. What do you say, <laughs> Jesus? I'm like, these are disciples. The guys closest to Jesus. You know what they sound like? Church people. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. They sound like church folk. And Jesus tells them, basically Jesus turns and rebukes them, so they went on to another village. So <laughs> the Lake County version, and Jesus looked at them and said, oh, you nuts. Jesus gave them what I call the melting face. They looked at him and said, hey, should we burn him up? And Jesus looked down like this. <laughs> burn him up? Burn him up? <laughs> the son of man came to seek and save, which is lost, not burn him up. <laughs> Come on, church. Because, because of racial prejudice, really? Come on. Social standing? Poli political views? Come on, man. Sex? Male and female, the genders? The alternate lifestyle, which we know what the Bible teaches, but burn them up, Lord. <laughs> I'm telling you, God's grace is enough for everybody. Yeah. There's another song we sing, right? Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. All of ours. Well, we're like, hey, it's good for my sin, but not for the homosexual. Really? Come on, man. Seriously. Burn them up, Jesus. Where's the love? Now, I'm not condoning homosexuality. 
I'm saying is where's the love? You love people. Jesus teaches about the cost of following him in Matthew 8, 18, verses, verse 22. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you the passage in Luke. Picks up right here in verse 57. And this is where I will close. So far, what are we looking at? We're looking at Jesus' brothers ridiculing him because they're telling him to go. And Jesus says, well, why don't you go? We see the application in our life. We we'll also see in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, we see that Jesus is resolute. And if we believe that we're living in the end times, if we believe our time is running out, why aren't we acting like it? You know, I remember, and I've shared this story before, where I was, uh, I pulled up, they, they just, there, was a, there was a fire last night on my beat. They called me, they, hey, you need to go to this fire. Well, you need to send the fire department. Okay, but they're coming. But I, <laughs> so I get there, I get there, and fortunately for me, the smoke eaters got there before I did. They were putting it down. I mean, they do what they do. They're really good. These guys are pros, man. They're knocking it out. I'm like, thank God for our fire department. Because earlier in my career, and I had a conversation with JR about this. He looked at me and said, man, you know how stupid that was? Yeah, I'm watching the flames. I'm like, oh, my gosh, the place is on fire. It's, a, uh, it's an apartment building. I went to the front door that required you to have a key or to buzz in, and I was like, ah! Door went in, and me and my partner, we went in, we split. Boom, kicking in doors, people running outside in their underwear or less and trying to cover up and running for their life because the flames are on, I mean, the place is on fire. Smoke, people running out, coughing and choking. I need to get my, my, my parakeet. I'm like, well, you need to get out. And so, and I needed to get out, but like a knucklehead, I'm inside trying to shoot people out. Why? Because time was short. Time was at hand. I couldn't wait for the fire department. Not too smart, church. Not too smart. But that's what I did. Why? I didn't want to get burned up. Most people die from smoke inhalation. But I went in there because people were going to die. People were going to burn. And I acted because time was short. If we believe spiritually time is short, why don't we act like it? Myself included, church, we need to seize every opportunity. So here we go. Jesus, they pass through Samaria, so even the gospel is even for those people at work that get on your nerves. Your boss, maybe. Those little boys slash girls I work with, they get on my nerves. The gospel's for them too, church. So the Bible says in Luke chapter 9, verse 57, as they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Here's the crux of our problem, church. I got to share this with you. And if you can't say amen, you can't say ouch. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, man, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Next verse. We hear that again later with Peter. And Jesus replied to him. He said, foxes have dens to live in. And birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to even lay his head. Jesus said, you want to follow me? I don't even have a home. Go to the next verse. He said to another one, come and follow me. And the man agreed. He said, Lord, I, I'll come follow you. I'll come. Some people are quick and impulsive. I'll follow you, Jesus. Wherever you go, whatever you do, I'm in. I'm in. Another guy said, ah coming but the big but one t the man agreed but said lord first let me return home and bury my father i gotta share this because the, the whole thing here is about about sharing our gospel sharing our faith jesus says the, the guy says let me go home and bury my father now the the, the original language if you unpack it this is what this is what you see the guy's father is not dead yet. So some commentators believe that the, that the father had a business, and the son said, you know what, I, I can't just depart from that because my dad's probably going to be mad at me. I need to take over his business. Wait till he dies, and when he dies, you know, we can, you, know, I, you know what? You know what that looks like today? God said, Jose, you need to be a pastor. And I said, okay, Lord, when I retire. Let me retire first. And God said, no, don't work that way. You come when I call you. I said, oh, well, you, uh. And so God, because the Bible says God's call is irrevocable, he continues to call. And he doesn't rescind the call. He just don't. So this man says, I'll follow you, Lord, but let, let, first let me go ahead and bury my father. And look at what Jesus says. Sounds harsh, but look. Jesus told them, let the, most translations leave out spiritually. It says, let the dead bury their own. Let the dead bury the dead. Jesus is referring to the spiritually dead. Let them bury their own. He says, your duty, your duty, your duty, your job, your responsibility is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. 
Not to be concerned with earthly things. Now, you may say, wait a minute, pastor, is he preaching against uh, families? No, he's teaching about priorities. Priorities. Do we believe that an eternity waits for us? Do we believe that there's a literal hell for people who don't give their heart and life to Jesus Christ, who cry out for forgiveness? If we believe that, then why aren't we making that high on our priority list when everything, all, all of this is hay and stubble? The cars we drive, we're more than, our, we're more than a summation of our, our money and our objects. And if you believe that, if you believe that there is an eternity that waits after this, then why is it not higher on our priority list? Eh, I'll come and help out with Awanas if I feel like it. If I ain't got nothing else going on. These kids, we're trying to invest in these kids to teach them about the kingdom of God, spiritual things. But first, let me go ahead and, you know, bury my father, which is a very important thing. But he's not dead yet. <laughs> priorities. Jesus is teaching about priorities. And I said this is the crux of the problem, church. The crux of the problem today in most churches today is a lack of priorities. Did you know old school Baptist? I've, I've been to old school Baptist churches and there's a lot of things I don't like about Baptist church. There's a lot of things. But there's some things that, I, that, that the old school Baptist, you go back, there's some things. Here's what I know. There was a church. They had, it was up north, had like maybe 10 members, really, and a couple of stragglers. But those 10 members were in their 70s. That church, financially, was doing just fine. Because those 10 members were tithers. Some of the previous five that used to be there no longer there because they died. They willed their property to the church. They were all in for the kingdom. All in. Their priorities were high. But they come from a different generation. Our generation today, I'm going to tell you, I put something on Facebook the other day that said, I thought growing old was going to take longer. That day we were at the wedding, I did the break dance move, I got up like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I thought growing old was going to take longer. Well, guess what, church? It's I'm here. there. I'm here. It's here. I don't know where it came from, but it showed up. <laughs> FedEx. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> but it shows up. It comes. And so, priorities. What are our priorities? I put something on Facebook the other day um, that, was, that was talking about the, again, the, uh, the growing old and how fast, it's fast, life is. I'm thinking I have conversations with JR and some other guys about, re they, about retiring. And they think, oh, should I work till I'm 55? Should I work till I'm 65? I mean, not all of us are blessed with 85 years of life. How much quality of life do you think you have after those ages? You know, those are things you need to think about. Life is fleeting, it's fat, and none of us are promised tomorrow. We could plan all we want to. Jesus said, let the spiritually dead bury the dead because we need to have kingdom priorities. Amen? So go to, uh, I said the crux of the problem is the lack of commitment. It's the lack of priorities. It's the generation. And that's what I started to say. I almost lost my train of thought. Uh, growing old. I don't mind growing old, church. I don't mind. I don't, I'm going to be 45 in October. I can't wait till I'm 55, 65, 75. I don't, I, I don't mind growing old. It's something I actually look forward to. It's, a, it's the seasons of life. I don't mind at all. I love being a grandpa. You know what frightens me? Terrifies me. Is the culture, the society. My nephew was telling me yesterday, he said, yeah, man, I, uh, you know, I was working here and I got basically promoted. Then I left that job, went here and I got promoted. Then I went here and I, I said, you know why I do? I said, because you're a workhorse. He works. I said, you got a great work ethic. I said, and you are an, anom an anomaly, my friend. Just people like you don't exist in your generation. He's like 19, 20 years old. He's a kid. And he's a hard worker. I said, you, most kids your age don't work like that. You'll work circles around guys because they don't work like that. The culture we live in, we live in an entitled culture. I deserve, you don't deserve Jack. You don't. We got to work for it. Okay? And so the problem with the generation of the kids that are coming up today, they expect things handed to them. My dad, he told me, you want to go get it. Go work for it. You know, don't get me wrong. I know people, there's circumstances. I get that. I'm talking about culturally, if you go, the, the generationally, those 70-something-year-olds, those 80-something-year-olds, that mentality does not exist today. It don't. And it transcends every area of our culture, ex including the church. So we commit when we feel like it. We won't when we won't. And then Brother Frank was telling me, you'll see leadership tapes I was listening to. People are willing to do 
whatever it is that you want them to do until it costs them more than they're willing to pay. And then they're like, forget it, not interested. So Jesus, what he's teaching here is all in, all in. And don't let these worldly responsibilities, and they are responsibilities, knock the priority of serving the king to the bottom of the barrel. Your responsibility, he said, is to go and preach to the kingdom of God. Another said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. And Jesus tells him, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of the kingdom of God. It's a heart issue. It's been said that the matter of the heart, or the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And there's a song we sing, it's called Purify My Heart. And that's how it says, uh, purify my heart, oh Lord, I want to know thee. Purify my heart. Uh, make, it ever make it ever true. I'm trying to remember to say, I can't do it without singing it, but I don't want to sing it. I already sang you guys so many times. But then he says, and make it uh, a living sacrifice. This is what the song is. Purify my heart, Lord. Purify my heart. Our hearts are in competition with so many things. Jobs, football, right? NFL football, fantasy football, whatever. Our hearts are in competition with so many other things, and we need to ask the Lord, purify my heart, God, and make it wholly thine. Make it a, a, a I want to be a living sacrifice. Has it got the lyrics? Purify my heart, oh Lord. Thank you, fast hands. Oh Lord, I want to know you. Purify my heart and make it wholly thine. Purify my thoughts and keep me in your presence. Oh Lord, it says abiding in the vine. Abiding in you, that's all I want to do, that your spirit might flow through me, a living sacrifice. I lay down my life, O Lord, that you might use me. That's the problem. We don't want that. We don't want a heart purified. Well, sure I do. The Bible says that we are double-minded. We're in without, you know, like that. So we, this is what Jesus is teaching in this passage. He's saying, look, you put your hand to the plow and look back, you're not worthy to be my disciple. If you want to handle your earthly things, even though they may be important, like burying your, your father who's not dead yet, then you're not worthy. of me. You want to say goodbye. The, the problem is we, a wise man once told me when you're looking for an excuse, any little one will do. And that's all Jesus is teaching. Make a commitment. That's what he's teaching. So I'm going to ask you, because we went, I went round and round through all these passages, and there's a common underlying theme. And you know what it is? Sharing the gospel. What are you doing for the kingdom's sake? Jesus said, your job is to go and preach the kingdom. What are you doing? Just before service, Brother Jim had no idea what I was preaching on today. He comes up to me and says, hey, pastor, got to tell you something. I said, what's up? He goes, you know I work at McDonald's. Bur McDonald's, right? McDonald's, right? I said, yeah. And he goes, I thought it was Burger King. It used to be. Got you. You switch gears on me, bro. But he says, hey, you know I work at McDonald's, right? I said, yeah. He says, man, I bring my Bible and I read my Bible. I said, okay. He said, somebody asked me, hey, man. Started asking me questions. He said, so I started explaining it to him. He said, you know what we do every other day? He said, I bring my Bible. We said, I have a Bible study in the break room at McDonald's. He says, I'm walking him through the book of Jonah. That's what I'm talking about. What are you doing for the kingdom's sake, church? I got to ask myself the same question. Are we investing in other people? Are we building the kingdom? Are we advancing the kingdom? Or are we just sitting on our blessed assurance waiting for Jesus to return? And the great white throne of judgment says a lot of people don't know the Lord. And they're not going to know the Lord because we failed to do our job. Because our hearts weren't pure, our attention was divided. Church, it's really simple. Share Jesus Christ with people that God has put in your circle. It's really that simple. Just share it. Sunday school, they're talking about living a consistent life. Brother Frank mentioned a, a, he came to a job where he was following a Christian who one week brought his Bible and the next week brought some obscene material. So the people at the workplace were used to this Christian and his inconsistent life, and Frank had to outlive that lifestyle that this Christian tainted. People were looking through this lens. So Frank said, I had to come and be consistent and show him what a Christian is supposed to be. Now, not perfect, of course, but he's striving. My point is just that. Be consistent, share the gospel, share the love of Christ, love God and love people. It's that simple. Don't be like the disciples and pray that fire comes down and burns people up because they don't line up with what you think or what you want. It's not, it doesn't matter what we want, church. The Bible says that God is not slack. He is patient that everyone should come unto repentance. God desires that everyone be saved. And it's our job to proclaim his goodness. How are we doing there? How are we doing there? Not so good. How are you doing there? Only you can answer that. I'm going to ask you, to, the praise team, to come forward as I close this morning. 
I'm going to ask you to, to consider that. Ask yourself, what are you doing? What are you doing for the kingdom's sake? When Jesus told his brothers, he said, hey, you can go. Are you going? When, when the disciples say, you know, they don't, they don't want to accept you, are, are, is your pride hurt when you're challenged? Are you more concerned with being famous or being, making a name for yourself, a social standing, rather than serving the king of kings? These are questions we have to ask ourselves, church. We have to keep our motives pure. We have to keep our hands on the plow and keep plowing. And when we don't, the consequences are we will reap what we have sown. Amen? Join me in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord. Father, we've covered so much this morning, Lord. It all hinges on two things, Lord. Loving you enough to share your, your gospel and loving people enough to share your gospel. It all comes down to sharing, Lord. Father, we're busy. I know, I get it. We got families, we got jobs. But, Father, we can easily make excuses and reprioritize our spiritual responsibilities to the bottom of the list because other things are more important. But, Father, you've clearly taught us in this passage that our spiritual responsibility should be at the top of our list. So, Father, help us to get there, Lord. Forgive us, Father. We're just human. We're flawed. We're broken. We're arrogant and prideful, Lord. And we want what we want, Lord. We just do. The heart wants what it wants. So I'm asking you, Lord, starting with me, purify my heart and make it holy thine. Would you do the same for our congregation, Lord? All the brothers and sisters that are here today, Lord, purify our hearts, Lord. Help us to see people the way you see them. Father, I believe time is running out. And my prayer is simple, Lord, that we, like Jesus, would be resolute in carrying out our God-given responsibilities. Father, we love you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Father, as I shared the, the passage regarding the pastor who, who shared about the gap, the frustration, Lord. Father, we can find our confidence in you, Lord. We can get our confidence back in you when it's shaken, Lord, when we look back and see the things that you've done. Father, I can certainly say that's true in my life. I've seen miracle after miracle, testimony after testimony in my own life, Father, where you've moved. And Father, granted, I may not be where I want to be, but thank you, Lord, that I'm not where I used to be. Father, I pray that prayer for each and every person that's here and for this church as a church. Father, though we may not be where we want to be as a church, I'm grateful that we're not where we started, but just a handful of people and no ministries, no children's ministry, no youth ministry. Father, you've brought us a long way, and we ask, Lord, that you continue to pour your grace out onto this ministry for your kingdom's sake, not to build a kingdom unto ourselves, Lord, but to build your kingdom, to bring you glory, to bring you honor. Father, I praise you and thank you, Lord, for your mercy and for your grace in our life. And I ask, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would be free to move about this place, Lord, prompting us to respond, Lord, not necessarily to the front, to the altar, but in our hearts, we would respond to what your spirit is telling us to do. Father, we praise you and thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.